I never thought about going to Africa. It wasn't a part of the world I was interested in before I met John Harvey, who owns Opulent Africa. I wasn't exactly afraid of wild animals, but thought safaris were far more rugged than I was used to, and I didn't want to end up sleeping on the ground and being eaten by a lion. But after meeting with John and his sharing the photos of the venues, the animals, the scenery, I was hooked and couldn't wait to find out how to visit this extremely beautiful place. His company coordinates every portion of your trip, except airfare, but the venues, excursions, transportation, all of it flawless. We booked this trip in 2020 for 2021, but COVID happened and things got in the way, so we finally were able to make our trek in May of 2022. We flew out of Tampa to Atlanta and then straight on to Johannesburg, a 16-hour flight on Delta One, which has beds, but not the kind you can roll around in, and neither of us slept more than a few minutes on the flight over. Landing in Joburg, as the locals call it, we were met with African dancers and had our first picture taken with swords in our hands. We went directly to the hotel in Joburg at the airport and went to sleep. The next morning, we flew to Mozi I Tunya in Zimbabwe. Jeremiah picked us up at the airport and we began our travels to our home for the next few days. On the way to Livingston, we stopped for our photo at the Elephant Crossing sign. On the road to the campgrounds, I saw my first wild animal, the ever beautiful giraffe. So graceful and elegant, they walk, or rather glide, with the back leg and front leg moving together on either side. Our canvas room had a living room, bedroom, outdoor dip pool, outdoor shower, and outdoor tub on the deck. It is winter in Africa at this time, so sometimes there was a need for the heater, and we never got in the dipping pool, but I did have them run a bubble bath for one evening. I just hoped a rhino wouldn't decide to pay me a visit. The first night there, following a lovely dinner, we went on a boat ride with our fearless leader, Jeremiah, as our captain. Full bar aboard and charcuterie. Here was my next fabulous sighting of a hippo, who seemed to be either yawning or laughing at us as we observed him in the wild. The first sunset was something else to behold. As a Florida native, I have seen many sunsets, but the crisp, clean, fresh air surrounding us, this was one of the most magnificent. We enjoyed a glass of wine by the fire pit before heading to our room for the evening. The lodge is on the preserve itself, and many of the wild animals roam around, treating us as irksome interlopers. Our room was quite a walk from the main lodge and dining area. And once it got dark, we had to be escorted by a guide who carried a gun with him, in case we ran into something that wouldn't stop. Sunrise came early, and we headed off on a game drive with Jeremiah. This was my first sighting of an impala. I was in awe of these gentle creatures who seemed startled to see us, but found how many of them were all over Africa. Jeremiah referred to the impala as the African McDonald's, as they have a fanciful M on their butts. I even had impala for dinner one night as I felt I had to try something new, but eating this beautiful animal and remembering their doe eyes was a bit disconcerting. Our next sighting was of a lioness and her cubs playing around. She looked at me and I was mesmerized by her strength and protective nature. The next animal with the curly horns is called a kudu, a type of antelope. I also had kudu for dinner in Cape Town several days later, but not a big fan of that. We stopped along a riverbank and Jeremiah set up a coffee station, complete with linen tablecloth. Coffee, cookies, and snacks, and it wasn't even 9 a.m. More giraffes greeted us on the drive. This tower of giraffes was a boys club meetup. Jeremiah then drove us to meet a vehicle that would take us to the helicopter pad for our tour of Victoria Falls, a must-see in Africa. The falls are twice as high as Niagara Falls and nearly four-tenths of a mile wider. The spray can rise 1,300 feet above the falls and are visible up to 30 miles away. The locals call them the smoke that thunders. This was my first and last helicopter ride. While amazing from the air, it was a bit scary for me. Prior to our leaving, a barrel of monkeys came to bid us farewell and seemed to be everywhere when we drove through the small town. 
Our next destination had us flying out of Zambia and taking a two and a half hour car ride in the dark to Kruger Park in South Africa to Ulusaba, the private game preserve owned by Sir Richard Branson. The lodge is built on a rock and in the center of 50 square mile game preserve owned by Sir Richard. We had private entertainment by African dancers whom I found out later were the staff, housekeepers, bartenders, servers, etc., all prior to dinner. The mornings were beautiful and we could see for miles. Steve decided to go on the game tribe the afternoon of our first day there and I opted to stay at the lodge. Deciding to go back to our room, I ventured down the spiral staircase from our room to the bathroom and came face to face with this giant beast staring at me through the glass. He was both magnificent and graceful as he fed on the leaves outside my window. On that first evening drive, Steve was witness to a pair of hyenas who were tracking something. They followed them to a pair of young leopards whose mom was out on a kill. The young leopards climbed a tree, which the hyenas, joined by others, waited patiently below. After 10 minutes, they came down and waited for their mom. The guide noted the hyenas would follow them to the kill and mom would give it up to them. The following morning, we went on another safari drive, two that day and the next to be exact, and saw the majesty of animals in the wild. Five lion cubs with their moms, hippos in the pond, and lots of elephants with very newborn babies. Somewhat disturbing, but part of nature, is watching the lioness eating a kudo they had captured and finding out the moms eat first and then the cubs. There is literally nothing left after they are finished. Our guide Eric and his tracker, Sipo, grew up inside the preserve, and when it became private, they and their village were relocated just outside the preserve. As a young man, Eric tended his family's livestock. When one was lost, his father, the most accomplished hunter in the village, would take Eric and together they would track down the animal. As a result, Eric and his partner of 10 years know the preserve like the back of their hand. They said they were like an old married couple, and it seemed that way as they bantered back and forth during the drive. They even had nicknames for most of the animals and showed real concern over their welfare. One of the most beautiful animals on the preserve, in my opinion, is the leopard. There were lots of leopard drama on the preserve, however, as this beauty had chosen to mate with the father and the son. Now, our guide tells us that the reason for this is so when the cub is born, both males will protect it. But it was clear the son did not like this at all. Neither did the father. And actually, the son should have left by now and found his own mate, but he had not. The next day we were tracking the female lioness to find the cubs who had disappeared overnight. Seems there were two male lions from another pride who had come into the preserve and the guides had heard them growling in the night, indicating a fight was on its way. They wanted to get the females to mate with them and in order to do that, they would have to kill the cubs, as the females won't go into heat until the cubs are three years old. But if the cubs were gone, they would go into heat within 10 days. It seems some of the females distracted the male lions and the other two female lions took the cubs into hiding. They found their way into the lodge service area somehow and someone had to unlock the gate and shoo them out. They later returned to the original kill spot from the day before. It was tense for a day or two for the cubs with ever building tension as their fate was unknown. It was also eerily quiet on the preserve as none of the other animals wanted to stand out when the two lions were roaming around. Eric made it seem that we were living in a real life drama, but the cubs were found the morning we left for Cape Town, so all was well for the time being. It was amazing how close we got to the lions and they acted as if they could care less we were there. Yes, Eric had a rifle, but in his 45 years had never once had to shoot an animal. They could tell when an elephant needed to be avoided when in musk, and which animals were just naturally nasty and they would give them a wide berth. At no time did we feel any concern for our safety. I was anxious to see rhinos and zebras and once we turned down this new road, there they were. Beautiful, beautiful dinners with amazing food and people from all over the world made for great conversations each evening at the lodge about what you saw, where you were from, etc. The evening that Steve went on a drive, he was witness to the hyenas tracking the young leopards and took some video of this interaction with leopards in the trees. 
Each of the evening drives showed us beautiful clear skies with stars so close it felt you could reach up and touch them. Just as we had morning coffee with Jeremiah, we had happy hour with Eric and Sipo, complete with snacks and open bar. We said farewell to Eric and Sipo, our guide and tracker, and headed for the airport to catch our flight to Cape Town. The Ellerman House in Cape Town, South Africa is like living in a private villa. While the service and staffing in both of our other venues was fabulous, this was beyond incredible. The hotel is situated on the hillside with panoramic views of the Atlantic Ocean. We felt like celebrities with anything we wanted within our reach, surrounded by art, opulence, and attentive staff. Outside of our room, which opened into the spa, was a beautiful pool and deck area. The wine cellar was beautiful and we scheduled a wine tasting later in the day, which was more of an education than anything. From the chandelier with wine glasses as globes, to the art wall depicting the changes in brandy aging over 20 years, to the limestone wall created from shattered pieces of limestone, it was art form at its finest. Oh, and the wine was pretty amazing too. Our big trek to Table Mountain was a highlight. While I'm not a big fan of heights, being in the cable car with a revolving floor was definitely an experience. The day was clear and beautiful and we could see Lion's Head and Signal Hill clearly from there. While there are many tabletop mountains in the world, this is the large tourist attraction for Cape Town. A little off the beaten path is the beautiful farmlands of Babylon Storin. Here they make their own wines, cheeses, grow their own vegetables, cure their own meats, and it was simply amazing. Approximately 2,500 acres of gardens, vineyards, fruits and vegetables, in addition to wine. We attended another wine tasting there. Uh, I think there's a theme here. And again, learn more than ever about 10 different kinds of wines and how the foods you eat affect the taste of each of them. And even had a couple of cases shipped home. Another incredible meal, ostrich this time, and a final sunset before heading back to the USA. As I wrote on my Facebook page, goodbye to the most beautiful landscape, food, and people I've ever encountered. I will miss you. Hashtag Opulent Africa.